You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Command Zone Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Ooh, it's time. It's time. There's a lot of pages in front of us. So the Commander deck building template is our most popular episode ever, Jimmy. Uh, But it's nearly four years old. Wow. Yeah, we were time flies. We were still recording this show in your apartment Mm -hmm. at the time. Yep. yep. Which is kind of (laughs) crazy. So obviously Commander has evolved a ton in that time. And we figured it's it's about time we did an update to the template. Yep. So this is the new hotness, the new template. The new template. But some things remain the same. For instance, if you're gonna buy any cards when you get to building that deck. You should go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. They're our affiliate, and you can benefit the show as well as getting the cards that you're already going to get, especially after this episode when you know exactly how to build your next deck. It's at cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Just type that in and you're all set. And then when you get those cards from cardkingdom.com slash command zone, you're going to want to keep them in really good shape, in pristine condition. You want them to be near mint so that they are as valuable as when you first got them. And Mm -hmm. the best way to protect all your game pieces is with Ultra Pro products. That's the stuff Jimmy and I trust our own collections to. They've got the Pro Glossy Clip Sleeves, awesome play mats, great deck boxes. If you want to protect your game pieces, and we know you do, Ultra Pro is the way to go. And the final way to support the show is directly at patreon.com slash command zone. We love our patrons. They get to see our best content, game nights, and extra turns a day early. They also get to interact with us on Discord, ask us questions, and we shout one lucky patron out every single episode. So this episode is dedicated, dedicated to Mick Bergeron. Mick, you rock. That's a cool name. All right, let's get right into the main topic here. So deck building in Commander, it could be pretty daunting, right, Jimmy? It's by far the thing we talk about the most because you have to do it to be able to play the game for the most part. Yeah, but if you haven't played a lot of Commander, and honestly, if you even if you've played a lot of Commander... It can just be really overwhelming to try and build the deck. Yeah. Um, just there's so many choices because Commander has options from the entire history of Magic, all 20,000 plus cards. So it's harder to build a deck in Commander than any other format. Uh, so this episode is going to be aimed at giving people a rough template, a good jumping off point when you're starting to build a deck. Uh, and I think people, they see our stats breakdowns and stuff on our other episodes, mm-hmm. and they're always wondering, you know, what other type of numbers should they be aiming for in your average deck? You know, we're always breaking down decks right. and going like, this is the numbers they have. And then people think, well, what number should I have when <laughs> yeah, I'm building throwing, this deck? <laughs> we're yeah. not giving them a, a concrete place to land. So this is going to be the episode that does that for the most part, because things will change drastically from deck to deck, as we always see. But there is a reason behind those numbers that we give in the stats breakdown, and this episode will get into that as well. Yeah, that's an important disclaimer. We're going to give some numbers estimates, approximations, but specific individual decks that you're building may have far more of certain things than others, Mm -hmm. you know, based on their needs. And the big thing is just when you're sort of straying from this template that we're talking about or going to talk about, um, it's fine to be like, well, you said have 10 of this, but I want 30 of it. Right. As long as you have a reason for doing it. I think if if you were somewhere to someone were to ask you a question like, well, why do you have so much of that? Uh, And you don't really know why, then maybe the template can help you corral and get back down to a a good optimized focus stack. Nice. Yeah. I love it. So let's begin where we always begin with the stats. That was a pretty good one. Yeah, that was good. (laughs) Well, we had to, right? If it wasn't, I may have asked to redo it if it wasn't good enough for this episode. (laughs) So many people are going to watch this, though, and we had to get it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're starting with the stats, the stuff every deck needs. Um, Mana ramp. We talk about this every single episode. It's slightly different than what we've said in the past. I've put 10 to 12. Mm -hmm. It's increased. Increased slightly. We used to always say 10. This Mm -hmm. is a difference from four years ago in the template. Now I'd say somewhere between 10 to 12. Hasn't changed a lot, but if anything, I want a little more ramp in my decks these days than I used to. I also will say a lot of colors outside of green have gotten a lot more viable, and ramp actually is more important because if it's an artifact, it could get removed. So you actually need a little bit of insurance there. Yeah, and the fact that so much more ramp has been made in the last few years and so much, so many more decks are including it, you sort of need to ramp just a little bit more to be able to keep up. You don't want to yeah. find yourself on turn five and six and everybody has eight or nine mana, but you've still only got five or six. Good point. The second category is card draw. This one hasn't really changed since the last time we did the template. You want 10 pieces of card draw in every commander deck, basically. Yeah, 10 forms of it. And of course, we're going to go into exactly what these mean a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, card draw has to be by far, I think, the thing that is overlooked the most, especially when it came to me building new decks. 
Yeah, you know, Jimmy and I, we have to build a lot of new decks and then play them in front of people on game nights and things like that. And so we've become very good at it. And I don't know about you, Jimmy, but one of the things I've learned is you just never go below that 10 card draw number. That is the most important yeah. thing that's going to guarantee that my deck is actually going to do something. Not necessarily that it will win, but that I will... I will be involved in the game and have enough options that I will be a factor. Yeah, and in the game when you're waiting extra long for your turn to come around, being stuck with nothing to do is real. It just feels that much worse for each player that passes turn. Uh, and then the next two categories have to do kind of with interaction and being able to sort of take care of the things your opponents are doing. Single target removal. Mm -hmm is a category, and this is a big change from uh, our old yes. templates. 10 to 12 single target removal spells in your deck is what we're uh, recommending now. This number used to be five. Yeah, and I think something that we didn't, you know, really account for back then is the fact that being able to interact is going to get more and more important as the game goes on. Uh, we sort of were in a different heyday four, the, four years ago when I was talking about Insurrection every episode, a card that costs nine yeah. mana. You never well, see anymore. You never see it anymore because a lot more things are low to the ground. More powerful cards get printed every year magic exists. And when someone's casting the Great Hinge for two green mana on turn four, you might want to be able to remove it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that as an explanation. The format has sped up. It it's gotten faster and and not just the fact that it's gotten faster but there are sort of more you have to remove this threats that can come out earlier than they used to mm -hmm. and so having removal in your hand cheap efficient removal and being able to deal with those really scary things when they come out right away because there are just more things now than ever yeah that hey listen if they untap with that good chance they either win on the spot or create such an insurmountable advantage that they're virtually guaranteed to win from here. Yeah, even just one turn rotation can sometimes be the difference between you winning that game and losing it. So yeah, more varied to single target removal. It, you can't just be 10 to 12 pieces of get rid of creatures. We're talking artifacts, enchantments, lands, all sorts of things need removal now. So having that flexibility is why that number's higher. All right, now board wipes. This number has come down a little from what we used to recommend. I put three to four. Hmm. And I went to edge towards three. I, I build decks now that sometimes only have two pieces or two wraths in the entire deck. I built decks with zero. <laughs> <laughs> not, not recommended, by the way. I think you but still want the ability to just reset the board because there are, you know, certain commander games, just the dynamic. There are so many more players. You get off to a slow start. Everybody kind of gets off right. to a decent start. And there are some games where the only possible way you could ever have a chance to get back into it is to just reset the board. Yeah. So I always like to have at least one or two options in my decks. But I think, you know, we used to want five of these. And part of this is related to why we want more single target removal now. I think board wipes are naturally just slower than single target removal. Mm -hmm. The format has sped up. And so you just don't have time now to necessarily deploy the single the the right. board the board wipes before like whatever advantage they were going to get just overwhelms you. It's better to just be holding up one or two mana, have a removal spell at the right time, stop, stop yourself from losing, than to like wait until your turn drops are back around. You know, is your board wipe six mana? Like, can you even cast it yet? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And is that the only thing you're going to do that turn too? Um, I think another big thing too. So a lot of times, if you look at the board state, it's never you know. When it is the case that every creature needs to go, then great, you have the, the hit all for that. But if it's like that enchantment there, that artifact there, and that land there, all three of those are the things that are killing me, your board wipe looks a lot worse because it could reset things, but maybe that just is better for the player that already has the value engine built. So as we've seen single target removal, being able to remove key pieces that make a thing as a whole function actually seems to be better and more necessary to keep yourself in the game. All right, so we don't have time to go super in-depth on the definitions for each category, but we figure some brief explanations are probably in order. So let's talk about what qualifies as mana ramp, just, you know, because I think some people get confused. It, mm -hmm. It's surprising sometimes, but some people get confused as to what is mana ramp and what it is not. Yeah, so think about a ramp first off. Do you know what a ramp is, Josh? It's so, the thing you jump off of on your skateboard or bike <laughs> or, you know, if you're Napoleon Dynamite, Dynamite it's on your true, bike. True, true. But if there wasn't a ramp, would you be able to jump as far? It'd be hard. <laughs> You'd have to try a lot harder, right? I don't know how you do it, really. You need, you need some amount of velocity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to go faster, which I guess is ramping itself. Uh, so mana ramp is basically that in a nutshell. It's something that gets you ahead of the amount of mana you would normally have. So if you're hitting a ramp, you're going to go higher than you normally would have. So normally, turn one, play one land. Turn two, play two lands. If you're ramping by the turn... Play one more land. Play one more land. Sorry, sorry. I'm trying to pull a crank <laughs> blanche over here with my lands. <laughs> if you are playing one land per turn on turn two, you have two lands. However, if you played a card that gets you mana with those lands, then you're going to have access to more mana. So if you play a soul ring on turn one, 
By turn two, when you play your second land, you're going to have access to four mana, while your opponents are going to have access to two. So that's what ramp is, in a nutshell. Yeah, it's basically... Have you played some effects or done some stuff that allows you to have more mana than if you just played one land per turn? Yep. Right? That's it. That's all that ramp really is. People get confused with cards like Pilgrim's Eye or Land Tax. These are both fine cards, but they take a land and they, or more than one land in <laughs> Land Tax's case, and they put those lands into your hand. Ah. And so that doesn't allow you to put extra mana onto the table. That just helps you hit your land drop, and hitting land drops is great. But a rampant growth, you know, it occurs to me that ramp might be named after rampant growth. <laughs> Wait a second. I thought it was a skateboard ramp. <laughs> I've been tricked. I don't know. I don't know where the term ramp comes from. But rampant growth or burnished heart or something like that, mm -hmm. these cards put extra lands directly into play. They don't take your land drop per turn. So they make it so that, like you said, Jimmy, if you play a rampant growth on turn two, on turn three, you untap, you play your land, and now you have four mana available to you you have ramped because you have one extra mana. You've got four mana available on turn three. Mm -hmm. And Burnish Heart is the same idea, but it's a card that can be played in any deck. Uh, and there's, of course, other cards that allow you to play more than one land a turn. So yep. that, in a way, lets you ramp, but it doesn't take the land out of your deck like Rampant Growth and Burnish Heart does. Okay, let's talk about card draw because, funnily enough, this one also gets confusing a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's more complicated than it seems. I mean, obviously, I think people say, like, oh, you look at Ristic Study or Guardian Project... Those draw you cards. That's card draw, obviously. That's yeah. really all that those cards do. But then we can talk about looting, rummaging, conditional draw, restrictive draw, stuff like Icon of Anc Ancestry or Herald's Horn, yep. or even a Impulsive Draw, Jessica's Will. Is that card draw? Hmm. Yeah, we did an entire episode about card draw. It's number 343. So we're not going to go into super detail here. Loosely, I would define card draw as something that says it gives you access in some way to cast more cards from your deck or your graveyard. And additionally, we would usually want that card drop to allow us to hit land drops to really count. Yeah, and that is something I think gets overlooked a lot, which is you, even though you could be playing tons of ramp, and we've seen this even on game nights where someone plays lands for the first four turns and plays a ton of ramp, but then stops playing lands, they actually end up falling behind. So card draw is really important for both refilling your hand with more spells to cast, but also to always make sure you have a land in hand to play every single turn and keep up with everyone else. Yeah, ironically, we are suggesting 10 to 12 mana ramp cards and 10 card draw cards in a deck. But I would say that card draw is actually more important mm -hmm. than mana ramp. You don't need uh, too much of it. But if you don't have any of it, you're likely to just have a lot of mana, but nothing to do with it. Yeah, right. Um, and, and also hitting land drops is just so, so important because that is sort of similar to ramp, right? It doesn't matter. Like if I play a soul ring on turn one, that feels really, really awesome. But if by turn three, I'm not hitting land drops, well, I'm not going to maintain that advantage on my opponents. So just hitting your land drop every turn will often keep you in a game. Whereas if you didn't do that, you would start to fall behind. Yeah. And if you look at the, both of the extremes, right, you'll understand which is more important. Let's say you don't have any mana ramp, but only card draw. Can you play the game? Yes. Because you'll draw a bunch of cards, play lands. Let's say you have no card draw, but tons of mana ramp. Can you play the game? You Eventually you'll stop. Yeah. yeah you, you say, oh, here's more ramp. Like, yeah, okay, you're cool. <laughs> I have 50 mana. What are you going to do with it? I don't have anything else. Yeah. 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 So, all right. Go. What qualifies as single target removal? I think this is a little more straightforward, but when we talk about it, we're saying this really means ways to interact with your opponent's plans. Mm -hmm. So it's not straight up just removal, although Path to Exile or Reclamation Sage, those definitely count, right? They come, you play them, you destroy something that's that destroyed a single target, that right. removed a single target. But I think we can also extend this so that it includes things like counter spells. Mm -hmm. That's still single target. Now, the spell has to be at a certain time on the stack, and you have to have your mana untapped and whatever, but a counter spell definitely targets a spell and gets rid of it, so that, that counts. Even things like graveyard hate, I could see counting as single target removal. For a sure, definitely. Yeah, um, that's a way to interact with your opponent's plans. They go to reanimate something from their graveyard, you go, what are you targeting? Ha <laughs> ha, I'm getting rid of it. Yeah, and single target removal can also be something that protects your plan. So a counterspell in that case actually functions as both. It gets rid of a card, but it also may stop someone from stopping what you're trying to do. Yep, and then what qualifies as a board wipe? This one I think is the easiest to understand of the bunch, but there are some nuances here. It doesn't actually mean it has to wipe everything off the board to count as a board wipe. We would count Wrath of God, mm -hmm. but that only gets rid of creatures. Right. 
Uh, would you still count Vandal Blast? 100% gets rid of all artifacts. Right. Bane of Progress gets rid of artifacts, artifacts and enchantments, and enchantments yeah. but not creatures. Uh, things like Navinural's Disc gets right. rid of most things, but not Planeswalkers. Anything that says all on it is probably going to count as a board wipe, even if it's a little bit limited. Even Calming Verse, which uh, I, oh, is yeah. a card I like. Some enchantments, huh? Yeah, it gets rid of all enchantments or your opponent's control if you do it right. And yeah. I would still count that in the board wipe category in most of my decks. Yeah, and like uh, Red, for instance, doesn't have the kinds of board wipes that other creature, uh, other colors do, but it has damage-based board wipes. So it, doesn't, it may not say, you know, get rid of each creature, destroy each creature, but say deal X damage to each creature. And that can oftentimes be enough of board wipe. Yeah, I would still totally count cards like that yeah. as board wipes. All right, so let's look at the stats again. I was going to do, 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 do stats. stats. That's like the quick stats. Yeah, the second time we look at it, we don't do it. <laughs> um, okay, so that's around 35-ish cards in our deck, right? Mm -hmm. 10 to 12 mana ramp, 10 card draw, 10 to 12 single target removal, and then two to four board wipes, three to four board wipes. Right. Um, which leaves us with around 64 cards to go. Again, uh -huh. we're averaging because some of these uh, are 10 to 12 or whatever. You know, our commander counts as a card, obviously. And our lands. We can't forget the lands. We talk so much about them. Yep. So we got to count lands in here. Most commander decks want somewhere between 35 to 38 lands. Mm -hmm. I will say that I think when we did this um, template before, we said 38 definitively. And, well, you can tell me if you're doing this, Jimmy, but I mm -hmm. have started to reduce the land count slightly in my decks because... Give me an M. Give me a D. Give me an F and a C. There's new types of cards that help you reduce your land count even more. There's MDFCs. There's also, we're playing a lot more um, low CMC or low mana value right. ramp and extra ramp in the deck. So if there's two more ramp cards in the deck, all of a sudden, maybe you can have two less lands or so in the deck. Um, That's not a hard and fast rule. Yeah. <laughs> but I, it is going, I think it's trending just slightly down. Don't don't, don't run 30 lands in your decks probably, yeah, yeah. but you know, 36. I've never gone below 35 and even those in the decks, right? Like I've gone to 34 because of MDFCs, but in general, you still need to draw your lands and play them every single turn. Now, if your deck is all card draw and you've got a tons of ways to draw cards, then maybe you can skimp a little bit on there. But again, this is one of the riskiest gambles you can take. And trust me, I've done it too many times <laughs> to know that it's not worth it. Yeah, I have a couple of decks that are down around 33 to 31 lands, but you're right. They have a ton of like cantripy stuff, a lot mm -hmm. of card, a lot of deck velocity. So I'm not worried that I'm going to get to my lands. Right. So that means if we add all this up with the lands and all the stats, we're down to somewhere around 30 cards that are really like the meat of our deck. Right. Uh, it's actually going to be more than that. And I know 30 sounds low, but because some of our ramp draw removal wraths are going to be overlapping synergistic pieces with the rest of our deck, um, this number is going to feel a little bit skewed. But I also like it that it's kind of low because building a commander deck's hard. And if you had to come up with 90 cards to put in there, it would be even harder. So 30 is kind right. of nice. It's like, oh, I'm playing around you know, obviously I got to pick my card draw removal, all that stuff. So I'm still playing around 60 cards, but the meat of my deck, the really important part is like 30 or so cards. Yeah. And we'll talk about this later as well, but biting off more than you can chew is also just a classic problem that even I still make in, you know, having done this for five, six years straight now. So being able to restrict yourself, I think it actually breeds a lot more creativity. Not to mention, like we said, there's gonna be a lot of overlap with the other parts of your deck. And that's sort of the beauty of commander deck building. For sure. All right. So in order to figure out what the 30 cards that we're talking about should be, uh -huh. we have to ask ourselves some questions. Right. Like, what are the 30 cards going to be? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think we're ready to, to ask or to answer that question until we ask these other two questions. Mm -hmm. Then the first question is, what will be the plan slash goal of my deck? Yep. And the other question is, how will it win or end the game? So again, not every deck's going to try and win. I know there are like jank or like story theme decks that are trying to sort of do they're playing a different game they're not trying to uh, obtain victory in yeah Commander, they're, but they're decks that might want to make everyone equal like <laughs> and the game has a tie too so yeah. there's lots of bizarre fun ways to end the game as well yeah and i think like obviously those are not going to fit into our templates so we're just yeah. talking about most decks uh, most players are trying to build a deck that generally is going to try and win in some way have a win condition yep yeah so the answer to these questions what's the plan or goal of my deck how will it win um are usually not always, but usually heavily, heavily influenced by which commander you play. Yes. So this is the general guiding beacon. If you if you learn one thing from this episode is that your commander will almost always dictate the direction of your deck. Yeah, not always, but almost, but very often, right? Very often. Yeah. Let's use the most recent episode of Game Nights uh, sort of as an example here, okay. just to sort of walk through what... I like to think of these as like movie log lines. Oh, You know, the decks. Okay. So when you sort of, you know explain what your deck does in one sentence 
you know, it's kind of like a logline of a movie. So the Yorn deck was make a ton of mana and then use mana sinks or big spells to convert that into victory. Right. The Magda deck that I played is in a world where you've got a lot of dwarves to tap. Use those treasures you create to sneak out giant dragons and cool artifacts. Yep. The Coma deck that Jacob played, it's something like play my commander, Mm -hmm. protect it until the board is covered with serpents. So the serpents, obviously, are the way that he's going to win and end the game. Yep. And then Turgrid, uh, not Turgrid, sorry. Turgrid is is not a card that we actually played on game nights, but it's from Kaldheim. Make my the card everyone's talking about because it's very powerful. Yeah, and please don't play it against me. Uh, Turgrid's all about making my opponents discard and sacrifice stuff, and then I'm going to KO everyone using Turgrid's ability with their own stuff. Yeah, Turgrid's, that's one of the reasons so powerful, right? Because the second part is actually tied to the first part. When I make them discard and sacrifice stuff, I get that stuff, and then I'm going to kill them with that stuff. Yeah, which is why, again, you want to build around your commander usually is because it kind of has the whole package usually or helps at least push you in a certain direction. You can also kind of generalize your plan and what it is based on the archetype that you're playing. So like token decks, Mm -hmm. a lot of times their plan is some version of get a lot of creatures onto the board and then pump all my creatures and attack. Yep. And then Voltron decks, which aren't as in favor anymore, but still very much possibility, as we saw with Tolski, yep. uh, is f- make one creature really, really big with all sorts of equipment, armor, whatever it is, make it unblockable or hard to uh, block, and then KO someone in as few hits as possible. Yep. Uh, combo decks, which are probably the most powerful decks in the Commander format, their log lines generally are find specific cards in my deck and then deploy slash protect them as quickly as possible. Yeah, and I think the most important thing is just here, you want to have a plan. And this is, I think, where your deck building style actually has helped inform a lot of people because, you know, you don't build that token token deck or Voltron deck. You actually build decks sometimes around ideas or themes, but it still needs to have a plan, right? Yeah, I think even if your deck's not going to be optimized or is not built around the commander, you still want the plan. So my Tim deck is kind of my big... I uh, also have a five-colored Nekuzar deck. Right. The Tim deck, here's the logline. Set up an untapping engine mm-hmm. and then win by using tapping abilities over and over. And that has nothing to do with the commander because there isn't a commander that really cares about that in the colors I wanted anyway. Mm-hmm. But it's still a plan, right? It, just because I came up with something outside of what a commander does doesn't mean that my deck doesn't need a plan. It still, it still needs it, yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I named it a new archetype. Oh, what, what is it? It's the Boa Constrictor archetype. Oh, was this informed by the Coma commander? Well, I don't know, ironically, if Coma is actually a Boa Constrictor archetype. <laughs> well, he sort of is. It is coiling. Yeah, he sort, of, <laughs> he sort of is. I was thinking of what to call these decks because there's a whole bunch of them that just kind of win through attrition. Yeah. And their plan is like set up some kind of engine and then win by just outvaluing my opponents over, you know, a certain amount of time. Right. And like aristocrats decks, blink decks, enchantress decks, artifacts matter decks, lands matter decks. Like there are a ton of these type of decks. I, I'd actually say this is probably the most common quote unquote archetype. Yep. Yeah. Now we call aristocrats the archetype of that deck, but these decks all have a thing in common, which is they're just trying to set up a combination of cards either in hand or in play that refuel. It's They set up a machine, right? It's, yep. it's self-running. They don't need to draw any more cards or whatever. Once it's set up, it'll do its thing and it'll refuel itself. Yeah. And in that process, it creates some amount of advantage or value. And they're just going to continue to wind that crank until everybody's boa constrictor to death i cross my analogies but you get me right well yeah and it's important to make sure you don't we don't confuse it with combo decks because yeah. you might think oh they're creating a combo on the board which they are doing but combo decks typically mean when this combo is assembled it's over everyone's ko that made infinite this or whatever it is if you're looking for boa constrictor think about josh's uro deck or my kumena deck that i played they're both green blue and they're very good at exactly this building an engine and then outvaluing your opponents and constricting the field around them so that they can't escape or do anything to get out of it you can always counter it or whatever it is you can find a way to stop them and win through your own plan all right important you want your deck's plan to be explainable i think in like one sentence yeah likely if you're finding it difficult to explain what your deck's plan is then it's probably too complicated and it probably means your deck is going to be unfocused Yeah, and again, like we said, that is the death knell for so many decks. And it also really doesn't help when you're trying to figure out if your deck works or not. Yeah. Because if you're like, I have 20 things going, and I think one and a half worked in this game, well, what about the other 17 and a half, right? So having a focus is really important. Like we said, what's the main goal of the deck, and how is it going to win? Yep. If you're trying to do too many things, you'll often end up doing none of those things. And then you won't even know even pieces of it 
you yeah. know, what pieces of it worked. I think it's much better, like you said, to try and focus on like one or maybe two things. And then when you're playing the deck and testing it out, you can really identify, did that work or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've, re you've removed variables. Was it perfection is the enemy of good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so obviously we can't go through every deck, every commander, every archetype, but regardless of what your plan is, once you've defined it clearly and you know what your log line is, it's going to help you really better understand what types of card cards your deck wants. So up next, we're going to talk about how to pick the right cards now that you have those questions answered. Uh, and we're going to talk about, you know, the best ways to identify them and then how to know what cards are good and what aren't under those rules. But mm -hmm. we're going to take a quick break first and hear a message from our sponsors. Hey, Josh, what you working on? Uh, just tweaking my rune deck. It's been feeling a little clunky. You know, as commander players, we put a lot of effort into our decks, but we don't always spend enough time working on our own well-being. Yeah, and let's be honest, that's often a lot harder than just switching out a few cards. Which is why we want to tell you about BetterHelp. It's an easy, affordable service that can help you get access to professional counseling. If something is getting in the way of your happiness or making it harder for you to reach your goals, there's no shame in looking for help. Whatever you might be dealing with, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. They're convenient, professional, and confident. Confidential. You can send a message to your counselor at any time and schedule weekly video or phone sessions on a timetable that works right for you. And BetterHelp is available worldwide. They have specialists for a huge range of issues. Anger, grief, anxiety, stress, and many more. I've been seeing a therapist for two years now. We want you to start living a happier life today. Plus, as a Command Zone listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash command zone. All one word. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash command zone. Aha! Flee before me, enemies! Cowards can't block warriors! And I, Kargan Intimidator, am a warrior to the bone! But I must confess, for a time, I too was a coward. It's true, I feared my credit card and the ever-growing debt it held. But then hark, I discovered Upstart, the fast and easy online way to get a loan and pay off that ominous debt. All it took was a five minute online rate check and Upstart was able to show me my rate for loans from $1,000 to $50,000. They helped set me up a simple fixed monthly payment with smarter interest rates. And with Upstart, you can get approved the day you apply. And start receiving money as quickly as one business day. So you can end debt cowardice and be a warrior like me, ha <laughs> ha! Or like start an Etsy shop or something. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash command. That's upstart.com slash command. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash command today. And now I fear nothing except my father-in-law. <laughs> Just kidding. We have a great relationship. All right, welcome back to the one and only, actually the second it's not commander, the one and only. <laughs> commander deck building template. The new. The new, new. The improved. The approved. The 2021 version. It's shinier than the last one, <laughs> uh, but actually has changed quite a bit. So we've talked about the strategy and goals of your deck and how to set them and define them with what Josh is calling the log line, the, the, the thorough summary in one sentence. And now it's time to figure out exactly what cards we do want to put in it. We had, like we said earlier, around 30 cards to slot in here. But even then, we've got numbers as well that are going to shift and alter inside this 30, as well as the ones that overlap with our other categories. So we're going to break it down to a few categories here. Yeah, you, you got to know, like, what cards, but not just what cards, like, how many of those types of cards do I want? Like, yeah. I know that, like, my deck really wants, you know, a two-mana 2-2 two -two with lifelink for whatever reason. Well, do I want 50 of those? Do I want 10 of those? Do I only want two of those? So it's good to put your cards into categories uh, so that you can start figuring this out. And there are three main categories that we're going to talk about here. The first category is what we call stand alone. Yep. So these are cards that are effective by themselves or in concert with your commander. Yeah. The main thing is that they don't actually need other things to function. It's not like a part of a combo piece, like Blasting Station. It's like, cool, it's a good card, but it really requires two other things to make it go off and do the really powerful things. These cards are great by themselves, but they will get better with Synergy, obviously. They just don't need anything else on the battlefield necessarily to start functioning. Um, and, you know, and you, I like that you wrote that with the exception of your commander, because that is a card that you always have access to. So it's okay to consider that, I think, in conjunction with standalone cards in terms of its effectiveness yeah for sure any other card in your deck if you're saying well this card is good with some other card in my deck well how do you know that you're going to have both of those cards at the same time mm -hmm. 
Whereas your commander, you always have it in your command zone. So I think it's fair to assess every card in your deck in conjunction with the commander because it's not like, well, how do I know I'm going to have access to my commander? You will <laughs> probably. Yeah. There's a good chance anyway. But uh, yeah, standalone cards are going to make up, you know, the bulk of your deck because, or the bulk of your meat, these 30 cards we're talking about, because it's very important that your cards, you know what they do and you, you know what to expect most of the time that you play them. You don't want to have to be all your cards really don't do anything unless some other card that's yeah. also in your deck uh, is also in your hand or on the board. Yep. So let's talk about a couple of examples. Um, one that we mentioned earlier, Ristic Study. Just functions on its own. All you need are players to play the game. Uh, and another amazing enchantment, Smothering Tithe, which is a card that basically anytime someone draws a card, you pretty much are going to get some mana ramp and some treasure tokens out of it. Yeah, they, they can pay some mana to stop you, but you almost always get the treasures. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Smothering Tithe is just a good card. It's awesome by itself. Obviously, you can make it better with synergies. You know, if you have Enchantress or Artifact synergies, that can be really even better with Smothering Tithe or if you're a wheel deck or something like that. But at the same time, you don't have to have those things going on for Smothering Tithe to be good. Yeah. It's standalone. It's always going to be good when you play it. It's always going to do its thing. Yeah, a, a word that people often use for cards like this is evergreen, yeah. or it's just, it is a staple for that reason, is then you can put it into a lot of things and it works. Uh, this next card is a great example of that. It is also evergreen in more ways than one. It's Eternal Witness. This is just a creature that enters the battlefield and gets you a card back from your graveyard. And there's no game, I think, that you play that you, won you wouldn't say, like, hey... I definitely could have used an E-Witness at one point to get something back. Um, obviously, though, if you are playing it in Josh's Rune deck, you can blink it, or you can find a way to recur it. Or let's say you're in a human deck, and it comes on the battlefield and actually, you know, it adds tokens and stuff. Yeah, the tribe matters. Yeah, tribes matter. But it's still pretty darn good on its own, and as a result, you'll see it's one of the most played cards in the format. Yeah, same thing with Smothering Tithe. It's just like, yeah, you could make it better with synergies, but also if you don't have any of those synergies, it's probably going to be good. You're going to want a card out of your graveyard to get back to your hand so you can replay it because wow. if you already played it and it's in your graveyard, it was probably good. <laughs> you probably want it back. Yeah. You know, I would say that creatures specifically are all a little bit standalone cards because mm. if they have an effect or something, that's great, but they're also creatures so they can attack and block. So in some ways, there's more onus on, you know, enchantments, uh, artifacts to do something else because or to be standalone because like listen it's right. not great in commander a 2-1 or whatever but at the same time like they can do some stuff on their own attack hit get some damage and block prevent you know prevent me from dying or something maybe if the creature's big enough so uh creatures have a little bit more chance to be standalone maybe than other uh other card types. And you'll hear people say, oh, that's a do-nothing enchantment or mm -hmm. a do-nothing artifact. But I don't think you can actually say that. You can't say, for the most part, it's a do-nothing creature, right? Yeah. Because it can always at least chump block something. Right. I mean, in Commander, we need our creatures to be efficient. So I think you, you could call something do-nothing if it was just like a two-mana two-two. Like, right. it's probably not big enough impact. But at the same time, like, technically, it can do more than an enchantment could that did the same thing, right? Because that's not going to attack or block. So right. just something to think about. Uh, speaking of do-nothing, <laughs> the next category is called Enhancers. And these are cards that either amplify or are amplified by your commander or your standalone cards. Yeah, so these cards, if they hit the board, they are what we would say just a second ago, oh, it's a do-nothing artifact or whatever, if it doesn't have a way for it to be used. It's almost like you're putting a part of a puzzle or a part of a machine on the board, but in order to make it spin, you got to put the other cog wheel on it, and that's going to make it rotate at that extra fast speed because it's built for that one thing or whatever that strategy is. Yeah, whereas standalone cards, they don't need any help to be effective and do things. Enhancers do need help to be effective and do things. Yeah. So they uh, increase the effectiveness of your other cards very often. This isn't to, stay, to say also that like all enhancers are, you know, straight up stone no do nothing cards. Some of them can do things, but you just wouldn't actually count that as very worthy or viable, right? Yeah, so it's, like not a, the full, it's not the full maximum use of why the card's in the deck typically. Yeah, so you could have a creature that's like a 2-2 or whatever and has an ability that causes it to be an enhancer because the fact that it's a 2-2, it just isn't enough of effectiveness that you would put yeah. it in the deck otherwise. Well, so, let's say actually a great example is it, it's Eternal Witness again. Yeah. It, it hits the board, but it gets something back, but it's an enhancer if you're a Flicker deck. Right. Okay, so speaking of that, Let's talk about some of enhancers. Panharmonicon, a great enhancer. It basically doubles up your enter the battlefield effects. Mm -hmm. Panharmonicon, if I pay the four mana and cast it, nothing happens. No life totals changed. It, the only thing that really happens is that maybe your opponents look at you and go, oh, that's kind of dangerous. Yeah, I'm worried about 
whatever you do next. But yeah. the thing you just did itself is not, it didn't do anything. And these are def textbook definition of enhancer because every single play you make after that, hopefully, if Panharmonicon's mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. your deck, is going to be amplified. You play Eternal Witness after you play Panharmonicon, you don't get one thing back from your graveyard, you get two things back. Yep. You know, you play Moldrifter right after you play Panharmonicon, you don't get two cards, you get four cards. So it amplifies everything that comes after it. But the Panharmonicon itself is just an enhancer. It does not do anything on its own. Yeah, another example I put down is one that I used to put in every deck because I was like, this is great. It makes all of my things do something, and it's Cryptolith right. And what you don't realize is sometimes Cryptolith right on an empty board where you have nothing else down is just purely an enhancer that does nothing otherwise. You need to have pieces on the board in order to actually have it fully use its ability and help you out. Yeah, Cryptolith right doesn't do anything. It just allows your creatures to do something that they couldn't normally do. Right. So the card itself, I think that's a good way to figure out if something's an enhancer. Uh, my favorite card, a card we talk about all the time, Jimmy, definitely an, an enhancer. enhancer. Yep, Vidalcan Orrery. Vidalcan Orrery allows you to cast all your spells at flash speed, which I love and I and I talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. That doesn't do anything. That just enhances the quality of all your spells after that. It's kind of very similar to Panharmonicon when you think about it. It just gives an additional ability onto mm -hmm. my card text in my hand that they didn't have before. Whereas Panharmonicon basically says, hey, if you got an ETB effect, do it twice. Right. Yeah, so it just amplifies later plays. Yeah, one card that is always a headache around the table whenever it lands is Grave Pact and or Dictate of Erebos. But here's the thing, you need things to happen for the effect to happen. Now, these things do happen all the time. Anytime a creature dies, everyone needs to sacrifice a creature. But that actually is getting into a deeper category, which is like, do you need a sack outlet and a Grave Pact in order to really have it going? So Grave Pact and Dictate of Erebos by itself has a world affecting enchantment, but doesn't do anything unless you start putting fuel into the tank. Yeah, very, very powerful. Anytime one of my creatures dies, all my opponents have to sacrifice one of their creatures. Ooh. Super powerful. But... That's just an effect. It's just like a new rule that's put onto your side of the board. Right. It doesn't actually give you the ability to do anything you couldn't do before as far as like you can't sacrifice creatures now. It doesn't help mm -hmm. you destroy creatures in some way. It just says if that happens, then this other thing will happen. So again, an enhancer. Another one I really like and would go well with uh, with Dictate of Erebos and Grave Pact. <laughs> and is, Eternal Witness. Yeah. It's <laughs> Skull Clamp, which is an, uh, an equipment card that gives a creature plus one, negative one, and then if a quick creature dies, you draw two cards. This is almost always used as a card draw engine. Mm -hmm. um, but Skull Clamp is an enhancer, right? Like, you play Skull Clamp onto the board, nothing happened. You have right. to have some stuff going on. You have to have creatures that you can attach it to for it to do anything. And mostly you have to have creatures with one toughness to attach it to for it to really do anything, because I don't think you're playing Skull Clamp so that you can give plus one, negative one to a two-two. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of good threat assessment in games is understanding when enhancers hit the board and whether and how much they're enhancing. Because yep. sometimes, you know, someone's a big threat, someone plays one of these cards and all of a sudden it's like, well, actually I'm not as worried because they need to do a few more things to really set that up to get it going, whereas this problem is more imminent. So understanding what enhancers are and how they work is actually really important to keeping your head wrapped around the game while you're playing too. I would say most of the time though, people... Uh, threat assess wrongly in the opposite direction. So uh -huh. a panharmonicon hits the board and they still laser focus on the thing they can see. Whereas, man, the panharmonicon, like depending on what they drop, that could be way worse than the thing I see right, right, right. now. And it's just like the unknown sometimes is hard to quantify and hard to calculate. Mm -hmm. So enhancers do nothing on their own, but are often the most powerful cards in your deck. We talk about Skull Clamp all the time as like the best card in the deck, yeah. in the decks that it's in. So just because we say, oh, that card doesn't quote unquote do anything does not mean that, you, you know, it's bad or shouldn't be in your deck. Some of the most powerful cards in the format are enhancers. Yep, yep. All right, let's talk about the last category here that we're, the last bucket that we're sort of sorting our cards into. We had standalone, we had enhancers, and now we're on enablers. Yeah, and these cards are ones that cover a weak spot or a missing blind spot that your deck would naturally have, or they get a little bit of help in bridging or filling the gap in your strategy overall. Yeah, so board wipes and single target removal, I think, often fall into this category. Mm -hmm. um, also, protection type cards for your board or for your commander or whatever. Because usually, you in your log line is not like, I'm going to destroy all my opponent's stuff. Sometimes, protecting your commanders in your log line, like Como we saw for Jacob's yes. deck, it was in there. But not very often. And... and Again, there's going to be exceptions. I can think of some off the top of my head here, but not very often is a deck's goal to wipe the board. 
Yeah. Sometimes it is, but it's not... the roof. Yeah. But Navinero roll. himself. Navinero you know? himself. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's not most decks. And most decks are not saying, oh, I want to single target remove everything that my opponents play. Again, yeah. there are decks that want to do stuff like that or Talran decks that want to counter everything, but that's not the norm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about enablers. Very common one, Lightning Greaves. Swift Foot Boots, cards we talk about very often on the show because they protect your commander. And when your commander is the card that makes your deck work, then you're going to need a card that keeps it around lecture long. Or maybe it's a, you know, a bring it back from the graveyard to the battlefield type effect, whatever it is. Those cards are meant to protect your commander and keep them around. Or maybe it's a crucial combo creature that you need on the board that no one can touch. And Lightning Greaves gets a lot better if there's more than one target that you might want to put it on in your deck. If there's some stuff yeah. that you'd really like to give haste to, maybe some things mm. that need to tap to do their thing, now it gets a whole lot better. You can you can make it better with Synergy, but it's really an enabler card. Um, it's probably not in your deck for artifacts, synergies, or whatever. Maybe those might be a thing that you would like, but at the same time, like a lot of people are just putting Lightning Greaves in a deck, and the only thing it's really there for, protect my commander. <laughs> yep. Teferi's Protection, speaking of protection, is another card that is very, very good. Sees so play in a ton of decks but is not usually doing anything that really lines up with the main strategy of what that deck is. But at the same time, it's a card that you really want to play because let's say you're going to need to commit a lot to the board for your strategy to work your tokens, your yeah. Voltron, your, you know, an Elf Ball deck or something like that. Teferi's Protection makes you a lot safer from things like board wipes. So that's filling in a weakness you're saying, well, my strategy, what is the weakness? Well, the weakness is I have to commit to the board for the strategy to really pop off. Okay, so this covers it because it means that as I commit to the board, I'm not sticking my neck out too far. Mm -hmm. I have a way to save myself if somebody goes, boom, board wipe. Yeah, and it also, in certain metas, might be like, my meta loves to board wipe. Teferi's Protection is actually a weakness that a lot of my decks have that don't have regrowth effects. Mm. This allows me to play a little more brazenly out into the open and then use this to sort of hold on because I need to win the game quickly. And if everyone's board wiping all the time, then Teferi's Protection enables me to do so in a better way. Yep. Uh, you can also do mean things, of course, and use it offensively with like Armageddon's and stuff, but that's not what we're, uh, <laughs> that's not <laughs> that's what what we're suggesting about. here. You I can do it, though. What, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, everyone can do whatever they want. <laughs> uh, as we said, single target removal is often in the enabler category. Counterspell, I would definitely put here mm -hmm. uh, because it is both single target removal and, like you said earlier, Jimmy, protection. Yes. So it might be like, oh, another way to get around a board wipe besides the protection is just to be like, hey, I counterspell your board wipe. Yep. You know, a way to get around your sword supply shares on my, you know, really key piece. I counterspell that thing. So, but also it's a, oh, you just tormented hail fired for 20. I'll counterspell that so I don't lose. Yep. yep yeah. Yep. Protecting that. Um, I also put down in Garrick's Wake because a lot of decks do want to keep their side of the board. And this is a board wipe that's on the pricier side, but basically enables you to push forward with your board state and comfortably board wipe and still do the board wipe thing. So this would be a card that potentially is like a crossover of synergy between board wipes and token strategies. Yeah, it's not the main strategy of your deck to board wipe everything, but you want to commit to the board, and when you do board wipe, you don't want to destroy your own stuff. So this enables your strategy, your token strategy or whatever, to still play a board wipe, right? Yep. Whereas if you had Wrath of God or something, um, well, I don't really want to destroy all my tokens when I do that, so I'm less likely to want to play that card. Yep. Yeah. All right, so the reason we've divided our cards into these categories, standalone, enabler, enhancer, um, is so that we can make sure that we sort of get the right amounts in each category. So uh, we're not going to split these evenly, though. It's not like, okay, we have 30 cards. Let's put 10, 10 standalone, 10. 10 enabler, 10 enhancers. Standalone is the category that's going to be the most robust, like we talked about earlier, because those cards function. You know what to expect from them. You don't have to have added anything else necessarily go right during the game, draw them in a certain order, play them in a certain order. You just standalone cards, you play them, they do what they're meant to do. Mm -hmm. And you actually don't want to have as many on the enhancer enabler side. I know many of you listening might be like, but those are what make my car, my deck so sweet and that most well, makes them tick. But it's kind of the same thing when it goes back to the mana ramp versus card draw. One of them is going to be more important. In this case, standalone is more important because without the standalone cards your enhancers and enablers get a little bit worse even if it is only there for your commander you don't want to have to ha always draw cards that say well this card is only good if you have your commander out if your commander has been removed two times that card in your hand just gets that much worse well i like what you said there too um it, it made me think like well what if most of the cards in my deck were panharmonicon right it's not actually good because what the heck is it amplifying right i need most of the cards in my deck to be cards or creatures that enter the battlefield and do something yep. so that Panharmonicon makes most of my plays after I play it better. 
Panharmonicon doesn't help other Panharmonicons. So you don't want too many enhancers. So let's go through just an arbitrary suggested <laughs> uh, numbers list here of how many of each of these categories you probably want. It's a template, so we're going to give you some numbers. This one's going to skew more than the the other stats for card draw and ramp and everything Especially like that. Especially in relation to whichever commander you have for your deck. Yeah, so really pay attention to what your logline is and what you want because, again, this can change vastly. But in general... I'd say you want somewhere in the realm of 25 standalone cards, mm -hmm. 10 to 12 enhancers, and seven or eight enablers. But Josh, you said we only had 30 cards we had to the deck. I count nearly 40 here. Yeah. What's okay. going on? What gives? All right. So the reason the numbers are not adding up to 30, and if you just took this straight across with our stats from before, you're like, oh, I can have a commander deck with 125 cards in it? No, you cannot. <laughs> no, and, and don't. Yeah, <laughs> so this is where we need to talk about a concept uh, that we call overlap. Yep, and this is when a card crosses over and can be counted in multiple categories, and is probably the most common way to make your commander deck really hum. This it's is really the key component to the art of deck building, I think. Yeah, yeah, because Magic has so many cards in its history, and commander only allows you to have one of each type of card, so you don't get to have that consistency of four Ember Cleaves or whatever it is to fill your strategy up. So the overlap is really interesting because you could have a card, you could have five cards in a single category, and they all overlap in different ways, but they all also share the single target removal category or whatever it is. Yeah, so we kind of, I like to think of this kind of similar to when you're building a mana base. So let's imagine this scenario, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. You have... Uh, let's say it's a 60-card deck just to make these numbers. Are, oh, okay. Uh, okay. You have 10 forests in your deck. You have 10 mountains in your deck. But you also have the red-green bounce land, the red-green shock land, and the red-green dual land. How many of each source? How many red sources and how many green sources do you have? Well, you actually have 10 green sources in the lands, 10 on the right, and then you have these lands that count as both. So you have... 13 of each source, right? Right, 13 of each source. But how many total cards is that? 10, 10, and 3. 23. So that's where our math seems like it's not adding up because you can count the red-green lands on both sides yep. in both categories. How many green lands do I have? 13. How many red lands do I have? 13. How many total cards is that? 26. So if you think of the cards in your deck in a similar fashion, a card can fill two different slots. Um, and then you can sort of... This, this is how we get to that thing where, what's the saying? Uh, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yep. Yeah. So this is literally how that math works out. And let's talk about some examples here. Um, one I like is Spore Frog, Fog Frog, mm -hmm. if you're in a Moldrotha or a Kenrith deck. So either of those is going to want to use that Spore Frog over and over again. The great thing about Spore Frog is you have to sacrifice it to get its ability. Right. So it's putting itself in the graveyard. It's a standalone card. If you don't have your commander out or whatever, you can play it, sack it. It will fog the board. Mm -hmm. But in Muldrotha or Kenrith, it's also an enabler because now I can do that over and over again and really get value out of it and do that whenever I want to. Yeah, because Kenrith, a lot of people don't realize, can actually bring stuff back from the graveyard. There's so many things that card can do. At and, instant speed. And that's why Kenrith and Muldrotha are so good. It's because they open the door up for so many new kinds of interactions. So the Venn diagram of what overlaps with those strategies just gets bigger and bigger. And that's why they're such prevalent uh, commanders in the format, too. Let's talk about something like Venzer Shaper Savant. This is two blue blue for a two two uh, yeah. flash. And it, uh, when it enters the battlefield, you return target spell, spell back to its owner's hand. It gets around, can't be countered, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. It bounces a spell that's on the stack, but, or it's it's spell or permanent, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So you I'll, can I'll check while you look. Yeah. So the thing about Venzer in something like Yaruk is that it fills a ton of categories. So Venser by itself, no Yarks out, nothing else is going on, does its thing. Play it, it either bounces a spell on the stack or bounces a permanent, correct? Yep. But also, it's an enabler for Yarok. It is a pinpoint removal spell in that, right? It's, boom, I get rid of your combo piece that you were about to go off with or whatever. That's what you know our enablers do. But it's also an enhancer in Yarok, and for a bunch of different reasons. One is, it's amplified by Yarok, but also, in the Yarok deck, what do you play? A lot of permanents that have entered the battlefield effects. Yep. What's good with that? Oh, bouncing them back to my hand so I can replay them. So you get twice the triggers every time you play this venture with Yarok, and that means that you can get rid of something, and guess what? You gotta do it again. Yep. You can bounce something else back. Also, you know, the cool little trick with Yarok and Venture is you get two triggers, right? Mm -hmm. One target's venture, 
one target's, target's a thing and now you've got a venture back to your hand it's like cap size but for four mana yeah pretty good yeah pretty darn good but it's filling look at that filling three roles three categories right. that card is so good in yarrick <laughs> yeah and venture shaper savant is generally just a good card as well like yep. just anytime you can see a card that's got more text on it and the text is all doing things by itself guess what that card's value climbs higher and higher because it's starting to fill more categories and spiritually if you see it it's like it's blanket of terms of what it works with just gets bigger and bigger yeah it's spider web of it's big yeah. diagram or whatever just covering yeah, yeah. everything yeah um, but you don't you don't have to just um have your overlap be with like the standalone enabler enhancer category you can actually have the overlap happen with the other categories mana ramp yes uh card draw in this case lands and single target removal as well for for a good old venture but yeah lands is great this one of my favorite lands in the game it's phyrexian tower because this overlaps with so much so it's a land that you can tap for mana but you can also sacrifice a creature and add two black mana and it's great in a deck like Corvold because Corvold cares about sacrificing things it also often is a lands deck so this is a land that is an enhancer and also potentially ramp because you can sacrifice a creature that enables your commander and gives you extra mana so it's doing all sorts of things at once usually when you're watching game nights and someone does something and everyone goes oh wow that's like an example of why Venser and Phyrexian Tower and Sporefrog even have that extra ability because they're starting to fulfill multiple things and people's brains are just going watching yeah. it happen <laughs> if anybody plays a card and you're like oh they could do this with this oh they could do that with it oh my god they could also do that with it then it's like oh crap that that card has a lot of overlap yeah that's an all-star i wanted to pause here because Frexing tower is an interesting case um i love what you said about it especially the part where you said it it might even be like a ramp card right and it's interesting because it, it only ramps, it only gives you extra mana if you sacrifice a creature, right? It either taps for colorless or if you tap it and sacrifice a creature, you get two black mana. Black, black, yeah. Yeah, so you get an extra mana if you can sacrifice a creature. And I wanted to talk about a concept that Jimmy and I use a lot, which is what I'm going to call partials. And this is not counting cards necessarily as a whole piece of either mana ramp or card draw. Right. So when we say, oh, you want 10 card draw calls or, or 10 mana ramp cards, that doesn't necessarily mean literally 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I can point to all the cards and that's how much mana, each of those mana ramps me. Cards like Phyrexian Tower might count as a portion of a ramp card. So you go, I got nine ramp cards in my deck, but I also have these five or six other cards that are mana ramp under the right circumstances. So mm -hmm. I'm going to add them all together, and that's two or three more ramp cards total, even though n I wouldn't count any of them singly as a full ramp card. I'll count Phyrexian Towers like a third of a ramp card or a half of a ramp card. Yeah, and that's actually something that is applied to Scry often, yep. where they'll say, like, Scry 1, that doesn't count as card draw. But by, that by the time you're Scry 3, Scry 4... That's about drawing a card. It's not a. F it's not actually drawing a card, but the value that you get should equate to around that. So this is the idea of partials, and that you can actually have even more sort of like split synergies. Um, now, obviously, you can't do this for every slot. You can't have like fifty partials to make right. five ramp. Right? Like you still have to. Maybe have you could, because that'd be a lot. It would be a lot. It'd be interesting because then your deck just doesn't function. It's, it's all, all just partials. Death shamans. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I want to play that deck. The deck would that be would good. be pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah if, if you could. Um, so then, yeah, partials you can add things up to be one, and we even see that with like you know like MDFCs. They kind yeah. of count as a spell and a land, but you can't one for one them because you'll just be in trouble if you do that. Right. All right. So ideally, I think you want your single target removal, board wipes, ramp, and card draw to have overlap in the enhancer category specifically. Other categories, if you can manage it, and this is not too hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. So like, let's look at Atraxa and Abomination of Landwar, which was just played on extra turns by Lady Danger. Uh, one is a Proliferate, cares about counters on stuff. The other is an Elf deck. So you wouldn't want the same ramp in both of these decks, right? Because you're not going to get the synergy. You're not going to get enhanced by the same stuff. So mm -hmm. in Atraxa, I might want Astral Cornucopia because it puts counters on the rock and then Atraxa every turn is going to increase the amount of counters and it'll eventually keep tapping for more and more mana. Whereas Astral Cornucopia seems pretty bad in the Aban Abomination of Landwar deck, right? Right. You could still play it. It would still do the ramp thing, but whether or not... A tr uh, right, the Abomination of Landwar does not make Astral Cornucopia better. Right. So I think the same mana cost, if you're assuming you're going to play Astral Cornucopia for three, is Farhaven Elf, which ah. is two and a green. And now this is an elf that comes into play and it puts a basic land into play tapped. So you've ramped, you've got an extra mana from here on out. But they, now you've got an elf on the battlefield, so it's going to make a Abomination of Lanoir better. It's going to synergize better with the rest of your pieces. Yep. This is a way to say, like, oh, what is enhanced or either enhances or is enhanced by my commander and my standalone cards? I want to push my mana ramp towards that. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next 
example we have here is with a card that actually I thought it was Reconnaissance at first, but no, it's a new card. It's Reconnaissance Mission. Yep. And it's a card that goes very well in an Alela deck. Alela is the blue-black fairy that pumps out more fairy tokens. When you cast enchantments and artifacts. When you cast enchantments and artifacts. Yeah. So Reconnaissance Mission is an enchantment that any time a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. Perfect. The card also cycles, but that's aside the point. So this really is really good with one one flyers. It's an enchantment that will make a flyer with Alela, and also those flyers are going to be able to attack and then draw you more cards. Seems pretty great. Yep. Let's look at the Zaxara deck now. Conversely, that something similar to what Jordan just played on the most recent episode of Extra Turns. This is an X spell deck that makes anytime you cast a spell with X in its cost, you get a Hydra uh, onto the battlefield, a Hydra token that's an XX. Yeah, zero zero, and then you put X plus one plus one counters on it. So. Reconnaissance mission, I mean, you could play it in this deck. You're going to have Hydras and stuff. You might be able to get them in, but they don't have Trample or anything. Yeah, your commander has Death Touch, harder to block, sure. You yeah, know. but I think a better choice would be what, Jimmy? Gadwick, the Wizened. Because Gadwick is a card that you can cast and gives you a lot of mana, and it has X in its cast as well. It gives you a lot of card draw. A lot of card draw, yeah, yeah. But the casting cost is X blue, 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 which matches very well with Zexar as well. So this is, these are just examples of how, like, hey... In the card draw category, from deck to deck, pick the card draw that synergizes with your commander mm -hmm. rather than, yeah, you can just play Cultivate or Rampant Growth in every deck and you'll be fine. But, in you know, sometimes don't just be on rails and be like, I'm just putting Cultivate in every single deck. And the Abomination Land War deck, Far Heaven Elf is probably going to be a little bit better. And the Atraxa deck, Astral Cornucopia might be better just because they, right. they're enhanced, whereas Cult... Debate does its thing, but it's not enhanced in any way. That's why it's hard sometimes to build like the template of a deck. Because you could say like, yeah, play Soul Ring in every deck for sure. But after a certain point, you actually have to make very specific choices to really optimize it and also feel good about your deck, especially if you're going for, you know, the Far Haven Elf and the Abomination Land War. It's also thematic on right. top of everything else. Yeah, you don't want every deck necessarily that you play. Well, some people don't. It's fine if you do. Yeah. Um, to be the same, though. Yeah, you know, cookie cutter. I, I like this deck to feel a little bit different than this deck, and there's one way to do it. Here's another thing. So in the single target removal category, um, let's talk about Moldrotha versus Kess Dissident Mage. Yep, Moldrotha it, cares about things in the graveyard, and so does Kess, but slightly different things. Right. Kess cares about instances of sorceries in there. Moldrotha cares about permanence. So in Moldrotha, if I want a kill spell, Shriek Maw maybe is a good one. Because it's a creature that you evoke out for a cheaper cost and immediately sacrifices itself and puts it in the graveyard. Yep. It kills a creature when it comes out, though. And now it's in the graveyard. You can use it again with Moldrotha. But in Kess, Shriek's Maw is not very good. It's not going to do anything. So you want an instant or sorcery. And now Terminate becomes maybe the card that you go to. Same mana cost as the evoke cost on Shriek Maw. And now it sits in the graveyard and can be used by Kess a second time. Yep. And who's not to say that you might play a Terminate type effect in Moldrotha, but... If you had the choice in that moment, you could tell, right? The instant speed doesn't matter anymore. Oh, wow. I really want the one that I can use over and over again because that's what this deck is built to do. Right. Also, Terminate has red, I think, so you can't play it in oh, Moldrotha. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the point is very well well thought out. Okay. Yeah, Doomblade, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> All right, let's talk about one more card, and this is another cool one in specific decks. Uh, and recently, one of our preview cards uh, for sweet Time Spiral Remastered. Frame. Yeah, with the retro frame. Very so, cool. Solemn Simulacrum. And let's talk about it in, like, Brea or an Artifact Matters deck. Yep. Artifact Matters decks are often artifactocrats, like we talk about. They like to sacrifice their artifacts, care about how many artifacts they have on the battlefield. They recur their artifacts back on the battlefield from the graveyard. So, Solemn Simulacrum becomes ramp, card draw, and an enhancer in decks like Brea. Brea wants to get the land into play, draw the cards, bring the thing back, sacrifice it to her ability to do other things. Yeah. Solemn Simulacrum, generally very good. You're going to play it in a mono white deck, a mono red deck, but when you're able to get extra synergies, Solemn Simulacrum is probably at this point better in red decks than white decks because there's a lot of artifact sacrifice synergies there as well. So in general, the card's great, but gets so much better. When you get a little extra synergy on top of it. It's yeah, sort you, get, of like, you um, get all that overlap. It's, it's like so Trading good. Post. If you're able to find a deck that synergizes with every single thing on Trading Post or Staff of Domination, that's like pure synergy, the yeah. ultimate. <laughs> and those cards have so many lines that you can usually find a lot of overlap. Yeah. yeah. And even if it's like three out of the five things you're using on it, that's still pretty darn good for one card, right? All right, let's talk here. Let's wrap up this section by talking about tutors really, really quickly. So... Tutors actually represent any card in your deck that they could go find. Mm -hmm. And so tutors actually have a ton of overlap in decks. They're very, very powerful. Now, some people don't like them because uh, it's not the experience of commander that they're looking for. I totally understand. But just from a... I, I've built decks... In fact, I often build decks these days with no tutors in them on purpose mm -hmm. just because I want the variants. But I think if you're building a deck uh, and you're not sure 
a tutor can be a good sort of catch-all for all the effects it could find. Because think of demonic tutor. What yeah. is it? Well, it's a card draw card, a ramp card. It's a board wipe. It is a single target removal spell. It's a standalone card. It's because the best it, card in your deck. It's the worst card in your deck. Yeah, it goes finds whatever it is that you need in that moment. And that is one of the reasons that tutors are so good. Yeah, and that's why they're even better in a Kest deck. Oh, my oh goodness. Oh, my goodness. Do it twice. <laughs> All right, coming up next, we're going to talk about how to cut cards, how to get that number down to the legal amount for commander. And we're going to talk about something I'm calling the magic number. Oh, like the game? Mm, like the magic, the game, but also <laughs> a number that's very important. Stick around. We're going to be right back after this quick break. Yeah, what up? I'm Galia of the Endless Dance, and I like to party! Woo! Dancing makes me feel good! That's why I always wear me undies. They aren't just like the world's most comfortable underwear. They're like how I express myself. I mean, look at these awesome tiger patterns. How cool is that? And me undies are made of super soft and sustainable material so I can be comfortable enough to dance all night long. So stop worrying about having enough coins to do lame laundry and spend more time on the dance floor. Get the me undies membership. Why do you need a membership? Well, I mean, you don't really, but it's Fun! See, each month you get a banging new pair of undies that match your style delivered right to your door. <laughs> then you can worry less about boring things like washing your clothes. Plus, the membership saves you up to 30% on like everything they make. So party in your underpants! Don't stop! Always dance! Woohoo! To get 15% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to meundies.com slash command. That's meundies.com slash command. Seriously, they're the most comfortable undies you'll ever wear. Do you watch a lot of screens? Well, trust me, I totally get it. All I do all day is watch, watch, watch shows, news, movies. Did you know there's a streaming service called Fubo? Well, I've watched everything on it because I'm Vega, the freaking watcher. I see the past, present, and future, and all three are full of screens. My eyes can't take it anymore. Thank the gods I have my Raycon wireless earbuds. That way I can take a break from time to time and just listen. Raycons are water and sweat resistant, They've got seamless Bluetooth pairing, and their batteries last up to six hours, so I can relax to the soothing sounds of my favorite death metal. Ah, so peaceful. And the best part is that Raycon started half the price of other premium earbuds, and they always look discreet and stylish, in case anyone is watching me for a change. Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for our audience, and here's what you gotta do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash extra. That's it. You'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order, so feel free to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash extra. Again, buyraycon.com slash extra. Ah. Just like Mother used to sing. Okay, we've gone through quite a lot here. We've talked about the statistics of the deck, the different kinds of cards you're putting in across the board. And now, you're probably looking at a pile of cards that is 150, 200, 300. It's an oath of whatever deck. <laughs> and you can't play that because it's not legal and also way too many cards. Trust me, you're never going to actually pull off what you want with that many. So... Now we're going to talk about how you get rid of cards. It is a heartbreaking process sometimes, but it's very important. And don't forget, I think this is something people forget all the time. You're, you're not going to just build one deck, right, if you're playing Commander. Maybe you'll build another one, and then you get to use the cards. So don't feel bad if you have to cut cards. But let's talk about a more clinical way of going about it, so hopefully you can get down to that 100 and get playing sooner. Well, also, the deck you're about to build, that is not the final version of that deck. So don't True. worry yeah, that yeah, you yeah, cut some point. cards. Like, you might add them back in later and cut some other cards that you thought were better than them because you found out that those cards didn't play that well. So, yeah, I think uh, paralysis by analysis is totally a thing. Just uh, eventually you got to make choices so you can play the deck. And when you play the deck, you're going to make some tweaks after that. Just know nothing's the final version necessarily. Yeah. Okay. We suggest when you have a, a bit, that big pile of cards that you kind of whittle it down to, but it's still too many for a deck. The first thing you want to do is sort of compare them in their categories. That's standalone enabler enhancers that we talked about earlier. Keep in mind those fundamental questions we talked about earlier. What is the plan or goal of my deck? How does it win? Also, don't go too crazy with themes and ideas like we're talking about. You don't want to try and do like 50 different things. You want to focus on like one or two main ideas yeah. or themes uh, to make sure your deck's going to be streamlined, it's going to be consistent. And then when you test the deck, you'll be able to tell, do I like this theme? Because then you can switch it out more easily, like you're just saying. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so let's talk about tribes and themes, and the magic number <gasps> 
is 30. I'm just going to say the magic number right now. To, I'm not going to hold any suspense here. I was waiting for something like angelic to happen. Or... Oh, 30. 30. It's magical. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I like 30. That's a good number. <laughs> um, and this number is more about specifically if your deck wants a certain thing or really is trying to push a certain direction, then 30 of that thing is how you're going to make sure that you consistently get there every time. Yeah, I was. I did a lot of research on this, looking at all of our decks from game nights, oh, cool. looking at like just decks people post online and other decks from people that work here and things like that. And it's pretty consistent. If your deck cares about a thing, you probably want around thirty of that thing. So let's look at some examples. Uh, if you have like a blink flicker deck, like my rune deck, it mm -hmm. cares about enter the battlefield effects on specifically creatures. Yes, about thirty is what you're going to find most of the time. Uh, Tesa decks the new Tesa that has the um death harmonicon on her she cares about death triggers on creatures she doubles them mm -hmm. most of those decks are gonna have about, about 30 creatures with a death trigger on makes it. sense makes sense uh brea one of my favorite decks ever loves artifacts wants to make them wants to sacrifice them wants to use them for all sorts of things you're gonna want at least 30 artifacts and in fact brea is one of those few decks where you can take that number way up because now you can have artifact lands you can have all sorts of different places token creators so you have lots of ways to get past that number with brea yeah it's it's interesting because i thought brea would be a lot higher in the artifact categories and yeah. most of the decks i looked at in the 30 range i'm not saying everything's exactly on 30 right but yeah but around 30 33 maybe then you see one of 29 then you'd yeah well uh, your commander makes two on entering the battlefield too yep. you can almost count that as one extra artifact card on the deck uh enchantress or enchantment matters decks a lot of them are right around 30 again uh this works with tribes i found too so hmm. zombie decks goblin decks elf decks merfolk decks a lot of the decks you're going to face or see or that people build and find, you know, once they've tuned them to optimization, they find that there are around 30 or so of that creature type in the deck, which I thought was really interesting. Even my Shadowborn Apostle deck, Jim. You get asked this question a lot, actually. How yeah. many do you put in? 29. Wow. Shadowborn Apostles in the deck. I think there's something about the number 30. It's about a 30-year deck mm -hmm. that just, if your main theme is that, that's about the ratio at which you are pretty guaranteed to get enough of it for the theme to play out. Right, and it, and consistently so, again, because you don't know what your starting seven is going to be and you don't know what the rest of your deck is going to be as you draw through it. And if you are limiting that number to like 10, 15, you aren't, just aren't going to see those cards very often. And you yeah. may have to aggressively mulligan to even get them in your opening hand. So that's an important thing to remember too. It's like, yeah, I have tons of card draw, but if you don't have an opening hand that gives you a direction where to go, that's going to hurt you as well. And that's why you want to have this sort of critical 30 number in there. So you have consistently know, okay, okay cool. This is what I got in hand. This is how I'm going to pursue the strategy for this opening part of the game at least yeah and remember this is the template so what we want to do is give you the best chance that the first version of your deck gives you the information you need to right. be able to tweak it further because you're never going to start with the template and just be like yep built it it's done it's perfect version one mm -hmm. so 30 i think is a good starting place now you might end up at 33 you might end up at 27 you know maybe even 37 or whatever but 30 will get you the knowledge you need in to to be able to make the decision of what direction you need to go yeah it's a good point it's not like cooking where if you oversalt something it's like well it's clearly oversalted you know yeah. you you, there's no way to take this all down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about some exceptions then, because this is a hard and fast sort of number that we, we're talking about, but there are definitely some exceptions. This first one, especially, I realize this very quickly with this deck of mine. Yeah. When you're building Super Friends or Planeswalker Matter decks, you do not want 30 Planeswalkers. You might think you do, though, because it's all about the Super Friends. I yeah. want to put as many in there as possible. And then you start drawing them and go, I wish that was a card draw spell. I wish that was a Man Ram spell. And I wish on, it was just anything, like a, a, a creature, <laughs> so that I w wouldn't just be playing my Planeswalker on two an empty board right right they need a, planeswalkers need a lot of support and they tend to have a big impact all by themselves having two planeswalkers in play feels like the equivalent of having nine elves in play a lot yeah. of times you know so you usually want closer to 15 maybe 17 18 uh planeswalkers in a super friend stack you do not want 30 yeah, I've even seen Planeswalker Super Friends decks go down to like 9, 10 yeah. because they're just trying to get doubling season and a Planeswalker out. So there's more tutors, there's more hard draw ways to just get that combo strategy going. Yep. Uh, I found that Instance and Sorcery Matters decks like Kess, Dissonant Mage, um, they tend to be a little bit higher. I think it's because it's two categories, Instance and Sorceries. Right, and you're playing those regardless. Yeah, and so those wanted to be around 40 Instance and Sorceries combined. 
Mm -hmm. uh, lands matter decks for the sort of same reason is that you're already playing lands, but when the lands contribute to your strategy as well, then you're going to boost that number even higher. So 40, 45 lands for those Corval decks, for those Lord Windgrace decks, because you need to have Tania. them. Not just that, you can't, every turn you can't just play the last land out of your hand. You want to play the last land, that one land out of your hand, discard two others, Do right? a million things, yeah. Because they represent spells and synergy slots. So they need to serve two purposes there. All right. The next way to evaluate cards for when you're cutting them is uh, it was popularized by limited resources back in the Brian Wong days. Marshall Sutcliffe, Brian Wong. Yeah, Brian Wong one of the, the OG, OGs. maybe all-time important seminal moments in sort of magic strategy ever, right? Like yeah. the quadrant theory just permeates uh, all of magic strategy across formats and everything. And it's no different. Commander, it's very useful. We have to recalibrate slightly for us. But the quadrant theory is this idea that you evaluate cards that you're thinking of putting in your deck on how they perform in four different stages of the game yep uh and so the four stages are one developing stages so typically the early game when you're starting to get settled ramping out preparing for the rest of the game the second stage is whenever you are behind and this happens much more often than not because you're in commander and there are three other players at the table typically uh, the third stage to evaluate a card as is when you're ahead, which is, of course, much more rare because, again, there are three other opponents at the table. And the final one is when I'm at parity. And parity means when everyone is sort of staring each other down. No one's attacking. No one's doing much because they're waiting for someone else to get ahead or get below and then move from there. But everyone's just sort of doing the old standoff. It's when you looked around the table and if you said who's ahead, it would be hard to really determine that. You can't clearly be like, right. oh, well, Jimmy's ahead. It's like, uh, it's pretty even. Yeah, good. Depending yeah. on what they do there, and they have a lot of untapped mana, so yeah. I don't actually know. It's a lot more unknown information. So you're taking each card that you're thinking about putting into your deck, and you're just asking yourself the question, how good is this in the developing stage? Okay, well, how good is this card if I'm behind? Mm -hmm. All right, well, how good is this card if I'm ahead? All right, well, how about this card if the game's at parity? You know, one of the differences between Commander and things like Limited or Standard when you're doing this quadrant theory is that we care more about the category of when I'm ahead. Because in Commander, you can be ahead, but you can be ahead at the point where, like, you need to close the door because combined, right. the other players will arch enemy you and they can overcome the amount you're ahead. You have to be ahead by a lot more to win in Commander than you do in Standard. In Standard, if I'm ahead of you by a little bit, a lot of cards in my deck will increase my lead or maintain it. Like, you know, yeah. especially in, like, Limited. Like, let's say I'm ahead of you, Jimmy, on board, and I've got, I've got a good attack. And then I draw a four-mana 3-3. Three, three. Well, I was ahead. Then I played a four mana three three. What am I? More ahead than I was. <laughs> yeah. Right? Whereas in Commander, you can be ahead and then not do much. And very quickly, it can be like, oh, they destroy your thing. They destroy another thing. Now the third player plays a thing and you're not ahead anymore. Especially now that we have more single target removal running around, right? If you open yourself up to not being able to stop or recover from that, then you're being ahead. Because, again, you just have the ire and the stare of all the other players at the table if they're threat assessing. It is just that much harder to hold on to. So as a result, there are cards that people will refer to as win more cards. And they say that with like a negative connotation because in most other formats, you don't need a lot of cards that help you win more. You're already winning. Yeah, just, you're already winning. Yeah. But in Commander, it is actually legitimate that we want some win more cards. Now, you don't want a ton of those because usually win more cards are not very good when you're behind or at parity. Mm -hmm. But you do want some, this is going to close the door on games that I'm ahead and I want to play those type of cards. Yep. Um, I also want to say that it's not really a, a process of judging each card and saying, well, I need it to do good in all the categories. Right? Because I think it'd be easy to misconstrue what we're Sounds saying Sounds like here. my parents and me in school. Yeah, you need <laughs> to get you do in everything. all classes. I'm like, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't play an instrument. I'm not good at music. What's yeah. the big deal? I just I'm still going to pass yeah. high school. Yeah. I won't be a musician. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> so think of a card that can be so good in one of the categories that it can actually be bad in the three others and you will still play it. Can you think of a card like that, Jimmy? No, we've mentioned it probably three times on the show already. It's, it's like the best card in the whole format. Gotta be a one mana, two mana rockets of soaring. You're always going to play this card no matter what because look, it's not amazing when you're ahead, but that doesn't mean it's still. It's it doesn't mean it's bad in that situation. It's incredible in developing stages. It's incredible when you're behind. And it's mm, even good at parity. on how you're behind, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, how, how far behind you are. But when you're ahead or when you're at parity, it doesn't have as much of an effect, but you're still going to benefit from that one extra mana. So many times I've seen late game plays where someone is just able to play one more spell out of their hand because they have a soul ring and it generates more mana than it casts to cost, which is so important. I just also think it's so good in developing stages, right? It's nuts. That it 
it doesn't matter if it's a little bit worse or a lot worse later because the advantage it gives you when you do have it early is so big you're willing to take your lumps that sometimes yeah i draw it on turn 12 yeah. and like you said it's not the worst thing in the world in a lot of those cases but it's definitely not like game changing at that point but because I'm willing to be like, yeah, but the, with the variance, when I do draw it early, that's going to give me a huge advantage in those games. I still want it in my deck. Yeah. So don't get blindsided thinking like, oh, every card has to do well in all the stages. Just consider all the stages and, and how good they are in each stage. Because some cards can be like, eh, medium in all the stages. That might not be a playable card as one that is like really awesome when I'm behind right. and like eh, just okay when I'm ahead. That might be a thing because you're like, well... I'm going to be behind most of the time in Commander. There are three other players. It's yep. not like one-on-one. -on -one. So this yeah. card might be worth a little bit more to me. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's also just a great way to just sort of do a blanket application to your cards. And the ones that just don't shine in the in the categories or don't feel like they're impactful enough, those should be easier cuts now that you have another way of looking at them. Again, none of these are hard, fast ways. of If it doesn't work here, it doesn't work at all. But they're all giving you clues as to what's good and what's not. All right, another way to figure out which cards you want in or which cards to cut is mana curve considerations. And this is the segment that's probably changed the most over the last four years. And actually, it's still at, well now kind of more controversial as well because yeah. I think there's, there's starting to be a couple of competing schools of thought here about this. So... As you start to whittle the cards down, I would use like an online program. We use Tapped Out, but there's a whole bunch, Architect and some other words, some other ones that you can put the cards in. And even if you have more than 100 cards, it's fine. You just click mm. prototype or whatever. And it'll kind of map out your cards on a curve. And it'll show you like, oh, you've got eight one drops, 12 two drops, 15 three drops. And it'll kind of make this nice curve for you. And that's what we call the mana curve. And that is just how many cards you have at each CMC, or I guess... Mm -hmm. Mana value is what we're calling it now. Oh, yeah, yeah, mana value. We're, we're changing it to mana value. I'm sorry if we call it uh, CMC for the rest of this episode. We're still getting used to it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, three years ago or four years ago, whenever we did the template episode before, we were saying that your curve should peak at the three and four slot. Yeah. Um, and if you're like me, the five slot. <laughs> <laughs> and now I, I'm looking at our decks, Jimmy. You said that, but I looked at our decks for game nights for the last, like, you know, you can see the change over time. Yeah. But the last year or so, the decks, the peak point is definitively the two CMC slot. We've moved forward or left one entire slot. So the one, two, and three CMC stuff combined is on average making up around two thirds, 66% wow. of our decks these days. So we are really pushing down the curve and trying to have the bulk of cards in our deck be low mana value cards. I think it's really important to note too that we're not doing this to play like we're not saying that seven drops are bad in fact we talk about expropriate and other game winning cards all the time and they're up on the higher slots but when you start to overload that side of the board uh, in terms of like what is in your deck in terms of how much it costs for the mana value then you actually get to cast it less and having the one to three CMC stuff making up the majority of your deck is actually where you want to be because that will allow you to when you draw those cards they're not dead in your hand you get to play your cards and it's just way more up. fun to play your cards and do stuff than it is to not do stuff yeah this is not a yeah people like to sort of equate this with like spikiness and things like this but it's just the evolution of the format a lot of decks you're going to play against are just a little faster than they used to be and if you haven't sped up a little bit you know in order to equalize that advantage that they're getting or what they're doing mm -hmm. then you're going to be at a disadvantage and so all we want to do now is just make sure that we're doing things a little earlier than we were doing them before. before it doesn't yeah. mean that like we're trying to end the game on turn five or whatever. It's also just, I think, naturally more powerful to have a bunch of two and three drops than it is to have a bunch of five drops. Because if I have a two drop and a three drop, I can play that on turn five with my mm -hmm. five mana. My five drop, I can also play on turn five with my five mana. The problem is my five drop cannot be played on turn two or turn three where the right. two and the three drop can. So this is just good strategy. This is just good tactics, giving yourself flexibility with your CMC. So pushing towards the low end of the CMC is generally good. I guess what I'm saying here is that it might seem obvious, but if you are considering multiple cards in similar categories, standalone, enabler, enhancer, single target removal, whatever, you've got a bunch there and you got to cut some of them in general. One of the good ways to cut is to say, I'm going to cut the higher CMC stuff. I'm going to keep the lower CMC stuff, the lower mana value stuff. Sorry. Yeah. And like what you said too, <clears throat> it's really important to know, like, let's say you draw, you had two slots at six. You're like, I can't cut either. They're both amazing. And you draw both of them into the same hand in the same game. 
On turn six, you only get to play one of them. Turn seven, things may have changed where you don't get to play the other one. So a lot of times, like Josh said, if there were two three drops instead, then you could have played one on turn three, and you can play one on turn four and another spell. And if you're looking at like, what is the total amount of mana I've spent in a game? And you're saying, okay, let's say I spent 50 mana in a game, and I only cast five spells. That's not nearly as fun as 50 mana casting 12, 15 spells, or whatever that number may be. You're just doing more. You're creating more synergy. You're creating more lines and more opportunities for you to have fun and hopefully win the game. Uh, so about the high CMC stuff, I just, as I was going through this, I looked into it. These days, Jimmy, our decks generally have four or fewer seven drops or above. We just have very, very few slots in the deck that we are dedicating towards huge spells. And yeah. I'm very aware of this when I deck build. I'm, I know you are because I can just look at your decks <laughs> where you're like looking at everything. You're like, I love all this stuff, but I got to only pick a couple of these really big spells because it's the worst thing in the world when I draw one or two of them in my opening hand. And I'm just, I, it's useful. It's like I'm mulligan. It's useless to me for so long. It makes your card draw that much worse too. All yeah. right, sweet. Scry two, draw two cards. I'll get those out of here. Oh gosh. Oh no. <laughs> I'm never casting that thing or not for forever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny because even with special synergy, I was like, I looked at your Magda deck and I was like, oh, with right. Magda, like he's probably going to have a number of huge things because he can cheat that stuff into play. Do you know how many seven drops you do? Because you're looking at a piece of paper. I do, yeah. Everybody out there, guess how many seven plus drops Jimmy had in the Magda deck? Six. Six. He only had two more than his normal deck. Yeah, and it's again the same thing, right? If you just start being like, well, clearly, it's like, no, for me, Magda is about focusing on getting the dwarf synergy out so you can get those cards out quickly because if you put too many in your deck and you draw them into your opening hand and that means oh that seven drop dragon could have been a two mana dwarf that that netted you mana and got you closer to getting that dragon you got to trend towards the side that helps you win the game and get your plan going more all right so mana curve is it's a whole episode we probably need yeah. to redo at some point so we're, this is as deep as we're going to go on this episode but pay attention to your mana curve put it into one of those those programs or whatever so you can look at it or lay it out on the table in front of you and that's one of the easiest ways because i think sometimes it's like oh i have only this for the creatures and you put your enchantments and stuff out you're like oh my goodness it's <laughs> loaded on right here and like i can't having 26 mana enchantments <laughs> you don't want to be there oh one last thing on mana curve i do want to talk about here very briefly again Keep in mind the mana value, the CMC of your commander. This is an important point when you're building your deck. So this will help you determine two things. What the CMC of your ramp wants to be. Right. And where your curve can maybe be a bit less. Because you know in most games that you're going to want to play your commander on time. For most decks, not all. Mm -hmm. But if your commander is 5 CMC or 4 CMC, then... A lot of times your four CMC or five CMC slot for the rest of your cards should be a little bit less because I know what I want to do on turn four. Mm -hmm. It's play my commander. I don't need a bunch of four drops because I already have a better play 90% of the time right. for that slot. It also determines your ramp because let's say you have a three CMC commander. Well, you really want one CMC, one mana value ramp if you can find it as mm -hmm. much as possible. And so in decks, maybe an Elvish Mystic goes in there where it's not an elf deck or whatever. Maybe, you know, you play a Birds of Paradise and a Wild Growth and a Utopia Sprawl because, you know, you notice with my Yorn deck that I played on Game Nights yes, and Extra Turns, it's a three drop. I really want to get it out on turn two. So I was just searching for all the one mana ramp that I can find because two mana ramp doesn't help me. I play two mana ramp. Then on turn three, I've got four mana, but Yorn costs three, and now I'm going to play him for three, and now I just have one mana that I'm not using. Yep. But that's also why you put a lot of lower cost spells in there is because when you start to spill over just a little bit, you have something to do with it. Yeah. I, I don't I don't want to over... Um emphasize this i think it's it's a good tiebreaker though when you're deciding which cards to cut look at the cmc of your uh commander yeah. figure out what normal play sequencing in a game is going to be oh, i'm usually going to want to be casting my commander here so maybe mm -hmm. maybe i'll choose this card over that one because that's the same cmc as that moment yeah and also i'd say like look at decks with like higher cmc cards too because like a coma deck right has seven mana cmc to cast or mana value that might actually mean in some cases you can maybe put in one extra higher CMC spell because you are so focused on ramping that card out that that's a consistent thing that's going to happen every game. So it's like, cool, maybe you can run another five drop because that five will pair well with a three drop when you get to eight mana or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. All right, let's talk about, to wrap up here, or not really wrap up, but to finish up here, <laughs> some common deck building pitfalls. These are common mistakes we see, um, you know, newer deck builders or even experienced ones making that sort of lead to you know, less optimal decks. Yeah, and, and unfun playing experiences. Yeah, I don't want to say bad decks, but honestly, like, to this day, sometimes I still 
build decks and I look at it and like, this deck is bad. <laughs> uh, just because you try too many things or whatever the, yeah. the, the pitfalls are. So it's, it's no shame if your decks aren't uh, firing on all cylinders all the time. Maybe these little common pitfalls we're going to uh, list here can help you figure out what's wrong with it and how to fix it or you know why that idea maybe just isn't ever going to be that great. The first one, uh, see it all the time, too little ramp or too little card draw. Yeah, you never want to run out of gas in the game. There have been too many times where I played and boom, you're off to a fast start, everything's running efficiently. And because you didn't have card draw in your deck or you didn't have enough ways to find it, you're just sort of stuck there top decking, top decking, top decking, hoping that you don't die and that your board can hold out. But every single turn when everyone's doing one thing to your zero, three to zero, then you're going to just, you're going to get crushed. Yeah, if there's one takeaway here, it's 10 to 12 ramp, 10 card draw cards. Do Just do that without fail in version ones of your deck. Those yeah. numbers can fluctuate based on, you know, after you've played it a few times, you're noticing patterns and things like that. But start with that every time, and I promise that will just make your decks play pretty well and allow you to f- discover the other things about it. Because if you don't have enough card draw mm, and right. you play your deck and you go, oh, the idea is not really working... Is it not working because the ratios are off on everything or just because you're not drawing enough cards that you're not finding the pieces in the right order? Whereas if you just had more card draw, everything else would hum. That's a possibility. Yeah. Um, so yeah, draw again is more important than ramp, as, especially to tell you, you know, when you're playing the deck the first few times, if it's going to work or not. Yeah. And like, how can you ever test drive a car in different conditions unless you have gas? There right? you go. Otherwise, the car just sits in the garage. <laughs> uh, the second biggest pitfall we see is not enough answers. Yeah, and this is something that I think we may, maybe we're the reason that people didn't have enough answers for a bit because our single target removal is a little bit lower on the total scale. I mean, I think we were right back in the day. Four years ago, I think yeah. you needed less, and now you need more. And we're trying to turn that around. We've been mentioning it recently a lot more. A lot show. more, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the main thing is just that you cannot interact. Uh, Commander sometimes is a game that you just play solo solitaire on your own but when other players are actually out to try and stop you from doing that you need to be able to interact with them and stop them from doing their stuff as well because that's going to stop you from doing yours i think version ones of decks often have very little interaction because what do you do when you're building your deck you goldfish it you play it yourself well when you're goldfishing single target removal spells you can't goldfish that because you don't know when anybody else has played. You're only playing your own board. So you tend to lean towards like, oh, I need this ramp and I need this thing and this is going to make me yeah. do this thing. And you're, you're really focused on your board and it's easy to just disregard. Like, ah, I don't need this. I don't need this Swords of Plowshares. I already got Path. And you just end up with a little bit less single target removal in V1s of decks because that's not the thing that was important when you were goldfishing it. And that's, you use goldfishing to help you make those last few cuts. Right, right. Yeah, stick stick to enough single target removal, again, around 10 to 12, uh, so that you don't feel like you couldn't stop anything your opponents were doing. Yeah, don't be a glass cannon too. That, or else that you also fold to something your opponents do. Sometimes when I goldfish, I'll just go turn four board wipe. I just wipe yeah. it all off. And it's like, all right, how do I react now? Does my deck have the capabilities to get out of this? Yeah, you also want to be able to get... I like that too, because think of somebody played a propaganda ah. or you know, a glacial chasm or something. You know, Can your deck overcome the speed bumps? Because your opponents are not just going to be like, sweet, do whatever you want. They're going like, <laughs> to try and stop you too. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, the third thing is one that we talked about quite a bit on this episode already. It's one that I hark on a lot, which is a lack of focus. Don't buy off more than you can chew. Don't, you know, don't like try and do everything because then you end up doing nothing. You know, having a clear vision of what your deck wants to do will help you focus. You'll know when you're in the car, ah, I need to go down this road and this road to get there. But when you have foggy glasses on or whatever, I don't know what foggy glasses is a thing. When you, can't oh, they're see, definitely a thing. when you can't see what's going on because you're toiling with the knobs here, you got to make sure it's the exact right temperature. You got to turn the windshield wipers. You're going to miss the exit. And you're going to miss the exit because you just weren't able to clarify where it was. You're too focused on doing other things. You were tapping too many things that didn't actually impact the board at all or further your game state or, or get a clear vision of what you wanted to do to win. Yeah, I think this is one of the bigger ones for newer deck builders, which is they have so many ideas and they want to do so many things. And it's like this deck, I really, I'm excited to do these five things. And, and they change all, commander forever. Yeah, they all seem awesome. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, they're all awesome. You got to choose though, because you can't do five different things with yeah. the deck. You can really only do one, maybe two. And hey, this is not going to be the last commander deck you ever build. So mm-hmm. choose one or two. 
make this deck that, and then you can make another deck that's about these other cool things that you want to do. But trying to do five things in one deck, I'm going to tell you, that is a recipe for a bad deck. Yeah, unless you are somehow the most perfect synergistic deck builder of all time, in which case, send, it to me, send me that deck list and we'll mm. see. <laughs> Dude, I can't even figure out how to make like an equipment deck work because it, <laughs> it needs equipment and creatures and that's just too much stuff. I'm like, yeah, oh, right. oh no, I have how to do I balance this? Where are my artifact equipment creatures yeah. <laughs> that can do both? <laughs> <laughs> all right, the last uh, biggest pitfall we're going to talk about here is mana curve is too high. Yeah. So it long gone are the days where you can just not do anything for the first three turns on Commander and have nothing but five drops in your hand and still have a chance to win the game. That's just not where the format is anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So just overall mana curve, even if you disagree with us and you want to play higher stuff, that's fine. If you want your curve to end on three and four, or even, or, you know, or peak on three or four, or even five, just don't push your curve too far to that right side where everything's, you know, four, five, six. You got tons of six drops, you know. Yeah. Trust me, at least in early versions of the deck, bring that mana curve down. It's going to be more fun. You're going to do more stuff. Even let's say you're in a league that is more casual or whatever it is, and the literal universal rule was the mana curve starts at five, you would still play as many five drops as you could, right? You're not going to stack 10 drops in your deck because of it because you still want to be able to do more than your opponents. So that's just another part of the mana curve being too high. All right. We made it. That's going to do it for our new deck building template. Thanks for sticking through it, everybody. We hope it helped you out. Uh, We're going to go to our To The Listeners section. To the listeners, what is your big deck building level up moment? How have you noticed you build decks differently now than you used to? Yeah, if you have any cool tips or tricks, I always encourage people to go through the comments because I think we have a really wholesome comment section as a whole. Everyone's always giving good ideas or debating things or asking questions and getting answers. Not always the right answers, mind you, but that's okay too. <laughs> it's good discussion down there. It's good discussion, yeah. And, and you're, there's always some nuggets in there as well. So I'd love to see what people say because deck building has changed and will continue to change. I think every single year we get something like Commander Legends, the whole format kind of takes a little bit of a pivot and a shift in a different direction and typically for the better because it opens up more options. Yeah, Magic as a game has continued to evolve and will continue to evolve. So the comment section is a way for us to keep updating and talking and making sure that we're you know streamlined. I think this video will be good for a number of years, but eventually it's going to get to the point where we're probably going to have to do it again. And uh, mm-hmm. the comments and p- other people saying like, you know, now I do this is a, a, one of the ways that we kind of determine that it's time to do that. Um, all right. If you want to get a hold of any cool standalone enhancer, enablers, mana, mana ramp, card draw, single target removal, board wraths, anything at all. Nice. Cardkingdom.com slash command zone is the place to go. Uh, there's new sets coming out all the time. You always want to pre-order stuff or order stuff if you're like me that you haven't got around to ordering from the previous set that came out or jumpstart cards if they ever redo that because you really want those. Don't miss out on Time Spire Remastered. Time Spire Remastered. Cool old frames on those cards, current cards. Really neat. Strixhaven's coming out. They oh, got yeah. cool like master style cards in there there's just so much cool stuff you know you're gonna buy magic cards anyway just use cardkingdom.com slash command zone when you order it and you'll be simultaneously getting the cards you want and helping out our channel helping out things like game nights and extra turns as well and let's say you are bought your cards you got them all home you're ready to suit them up well head on over to your local game store because we got to support them during this time and maybe they have tons of cool ultra pro product they've got play mats they've got sleeves deck 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 duh, dice and deck boxes everything you need to outfit your cards but more importantly keep them safe because you want to be able to play these cards for years and years to come and the fact that i still have cards in mint condition from when i was <laughs> seven eight years old makes me really happy because it brings me back to that moment and the scuffs around it sure yeah that's a big part of loving your cards too but truly loving your cards and maybe even someday passing it on to someone else i love Mm. donating cards and decks craig has given me so many cards when i started playing and they're all in great condition it made me really appreciate the fact that he took time and care to take care of them because they meant something to him and none of your cards mean something to you so outfit them with ultra pro yeah, Ultra Pro, definitely the best stuff to protect your stuff. And uh, the ones that Jimmy and I trust are our own collections oh. with. Okay. I'm excited for this end step. Now it's you time for this. the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. It's happened, Jimmy. I reached the end <laughs> of the internet. I, I saw everything. I watched all the stream shows on every yep. streaming service. Yep, yep. Uh, you're probably there too because of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm actually having caught up on WandaVision. Uh, oh. I, I, I think at this point, I'm just going to wait for it to end and then binge it all. Oh, nice. So I'm, I'm almost at the end here. I'm looking over the edge. WandaVision, very good. This is not the end step, but I am caught up. Um, so I started watching a show that I've already watched before. Oh, I thought you hadn't watched it before. Oh, you know, no. But I think we have talked about this in the past. Yeah, I, I've worn my Battlestar Galactic shirt on the show before. I, I've, I watched through... Um, you know, when it was originally on mm-hmm. in real time, more, wow. more or less. Whoa, whoa, that's cool. But 
I just saw it pop up like as a recommended video or something. And I was like, Battlestar Galactica. I haven't watched that in forever. And I was like, I'll give it a try. Okay. You know, I'm going to watch the first episode. And I was like, man, this show's good. It's so good. <laughs> it's still it's good. It's so good. I remember watching it maybe five or six years ago and being like, this is an old sci-fi show. The graphics are going to suck. I'm not going to... F- and you're like, oh my gosh, so say we all. <laughs> it's so good. It just still works. It, yeah, the acting is incredible. Yep. Oh my gosh. Katie Sackhoff is amazing oh, in there Sackhoff as well. Is so good. If you it? watch The Mandalorian, she makes an awesome, awesome appearance in that show as well. So I I, I love Battlestar Galactica. Well, last season, not so much, but it doesn't matter because even the, the there's a movie, right? That's like kind of the first episode. It's like a longer pilot. Yeah, it's like a mini. It's a miniseries, I think they call it, but it's really just two long episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's that to start, which is the, that's what I watched first. And then I just was like, well, I'm watching the show now. And I went into the first season and I'm like, you know, five or six episodes in. And oh, it gets so good. So the show's, fast. yeah, I think a little bit of the shine did get taken off of the show because the ending a lot of people were kind of a little bit lackluster about. But I, I would I say to people out there, yet. like, don't let that deter you from watching it because the journey along, you know, all the episodes up till the last few is so worth it. Yeah. That, like, just because the, the last couple of episodes maybe didn't like hit a grand slam home run they're still fine um it doesn't take away from how awesome so many of the episodes between the start and there are so battlestar galactica if you have not watched it if you watch our channel you like fantasy and sci-fi and stuff probably so i would say i would just highly recommend as one of the probably one of the great tv shows of all time yeah again the acting superb edward is it edward james almost edward james almost almost yeah he he's incredible too um you will be saying you will be wishing you were a part of that crew by the end of yeah. the, the show, for so sure. So good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Clean up step time. Our editing, graphics, and logistics team here at the Command Zone is Craig Blanchett, Arthur Meadowcroft, Ashlyn Rose, Lady Danger, Alfred Desaka, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Non, Jordan Perridge, and Manson Lung, and Sam Waldo. Woo! Good job. You did it all in one breath almost? Almost, yeah. I kind of cheated. I took a breath <laughs> after the second name. And a big thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who does the living card animations that begin uh, all of our podcast episodes. He does a lot of the windows behind us, although this, this one was done by Sam. Mm-hmm. Jeffrey also uh, helping us out a little bit on animations on game nights as well. So he's getting to work with us a little more again. Uh, and you can find him on Twitter at livingcardsmtg. All right, everyone, make sure you share this episode. If someone out there is trying to start building a deck in Commander, or maybe there's someone at your table that you think needs it, but uh, you know, maybe you're the one that needs it. You're just saying it's your friend, but it's okay. It's okay. Just share it with them. <laughs> I still need it, to yeah. tell you the truth. Yeah, I got to remind myself all the time. Like, oh, no, no, don't, no, no. You can only have that many seven drops. I will say this, though. Having now done these things in this, I have so much more fun playing Commander. Gone are the days of Jimmy Mana Screwed and Jimmy not drawing enough cards because I just don't build decks like that anymore. I got to say, because of game nights, we have to play, a, we have to build decks all the time and play them, you know, without very many revisions, without knowing how good they are right. quite often, right? We get a little bit of testing, but not a lot. And we're playing them in front of so many people that, yeah, we have to be... You get one shot. Too, this is right? why we've honed our skills at this part of the process, which is having a good V1, because, you know, we have to do it all the time. So, yeah, hopefully it helps everybody else out there as well. The first time you sit down with your deck, you're not feeling like it's probably not going to work. You're feeling like it's going to do some stuff for sure. I mean, I might have to tweak it, but it's still going to be pretty good. Yeah. Right from the go. All right. Well, hope you all draw lots of lands and lots of spells, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com. Or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>